Butler. I've been a sportscaster my entire life. Any aspiring sportscasters in here? Anyone? One? Two? Well, I'm here to tell you sportscasting isn't all just about media. It's a full marketing component in this industry as well. You guys can always connect with me on Twitter, at the Gina Miller, if you want to tweet me while we're doing this or share anything that we're doing. A um, little bit about me first. I, I wish that when I was in school, I had this kind of opportunity you guys did. I'm from Dallas, born and raised, went to Lake Hill Prep. Anybody know that school? It's a TAPS 1A private school. You wouldn't know it. Um, went to University of Houston, where I wanted to be a sportscaster, but I couldn't get an opportunity to intern because I was too young in my college career to intern. So I ended up, long story short, getting an internship with the Houston Rockets during a quite serendipitous time because I won an NBA championship ring. It was during the 94-95 season when they won their second title. Mm -hmm. You can pass around and check it out if you want. Um, won a championship ring. Uh, didn't really want to go into sports media PR, really. I was an intern in the media services department. There's a long story about how I got that internship, but we don't have time to get into it. So ended up getting a job because of my internship and the connections that I made. I ended up getting a job at KHOU, the CBS affiliate in Houston, where I was basically a paid intern. I made seven bucks an hour being an assistant sports producer. And because I had so many great connections in the Houston sports community, I was able to go out and do a lot of fun stories and, and build up my resume tape to get on air. Once I graduated college, my first on air job was as the sports director of KUAM TV in Guam. Anybody know where that is? Guam. Small island below Asia and above Australia in the middle of the South Pacific. Mm -hmm. It's like a 24, Micronesia. It's a 24 hour flight, literally, from Dallas, Fort Worth. Worked in Guam, then I got a job in Knoxville, came back home, worked at the NBC affiliate uh, covering SEC sports. I covered Peyton Manning during his last year at the University of Tennessee, covered the Lady Balls during two national championship runs. Following that, after two and a half years, moved back home to Dallas to work for the Dallas Cowboys for three years. I worked in sports media, but in sports marketing at the same time. I worked for the Cowboys TV department. The Cowboys television department were one of three departments in the NFL to have their in-house media team. The Cowboys, the Dolphins, and the New York Giants were the first three NFL teams to do that, to produce original programming like Special Edition with Jerry Jones, the Dave Campo Show, which is one of the shows I produce and host at the time, that sort of thing. Following that, I got a job at WFAA TV. Then following that, I worked at CBS 11 and TXA 21, where I hosted an hour-long sports talk show, the Fan Sports Show. Heiko was a guest on there a few times. I also hosted Dallas Cowboys, Dallas Mavericks, Dallas Stars, and Texas Rangers pre- and post-game shows. Covered everything, talked to and met idols that I grew up loving. I co-hosted a show with Derek Harper for eight years. I mean, I've been a Mavericks MFFL my whole life, that sort of thing. But um, there are certain things about working in sports media you need to know, and in sports marketing. To echo a lot of the same sentiments you guys have heard here over the course of the past couple of hours, it's about who you know, and it's about getting experience. I'm a big believer in internships. Internships are so important because there's only so much you can learn in a classroom setting. You really need that contextual, real-world experience to get your resume built, to gain that opportunity, to gain that experience and knowledge. So when you get out there in the real world, you know what you're doing. Because quite frankly, there isn't much of a learning curve when you get a job anymore. You're expected to know these entry-level things when you start on the job. And because you guys are so young and you're so media savvy, fair or not, you're expected to be the expert. Because it's usually old people like me and my colleagues in here that are hiring you guys. You guys are expected to come in and teach people Snapchat, teach people Periscope. I'm doing Periscope chat today at 1.30 if any of you are interested. But you guys are expected to teach people those things. And you have that opportunity right now. That's the cool thing about this whole media and marketing and management sports game. It's all democratized. You can start a blog. You can start a website. You can start a video blog to learn how to refine your voice and refine your on-camera or your or behind the microphone presentation. You can do all this right now for free. When I was back in the day, when I was doing this, I didn't have that opportunity. So you guys can start doing all this right now, and I encourage each and every one of you to start because it will really put you ahead of your competition when you're entering college and then when you enter yourself in the workforce. Trust me on this. So let's just go through this very, very quickly for those of you who want to career in sports media, and it fully applies to sports marketing as well. Working in sports media is a blast, but not nearly as glamorous as it seems. When I hosted the Mavericks pre- and post-game shows, I made this joke. Everybody thinks that I was in the Platinum Club at the AAC, chest bumping and hanging out with Derek Harper and all my girlfriends. No. 
You don't you don't go to games and hang out. You work games. In media, you cover games. If you're working on the ticket side, you're dealing with a couple hundred people whose tickets got messed up. If you're dealing in suite sales, you're dealing with somebody's food order who didn't come through in the suite. If you're working in sports media, you are sitting there in a press box generally watching the game on television, not in person, and you're listening to the game on the radio, watching the game on TV, and taking notes and tweeting about it at the same time. There's a lot of work that goes on into working a game. You will do more research and homework as a sports marketing and sports media professional than you ever do right now. Trust me on this. Go to sports marketing, you're going to have to know the history of a team, the history of a matchup, why a particular matchup is important. Sports media, I did hour-long pre- and post-game shows. I had to know every single detail about a particular team, a matchup, the players, the history, the context of why a particular matchup is important. And half the time, I'd say 90% of the time, I didn't use any of that information because I ended up talking with my partner about various other things. But you don't want to be in a position where you don't know what it is you're talking about. If you're in sales, you have to be ready to answer any single question a potential client asks you. Whatever that question may be, you don't want to be standing there not knowing that information. You will do a lot of homework if you're working in sports media. Again, I go back to working games. You don't watch games, you cover them. There is no cheering in a press box, ever. When I won that NBA championship ring, I was in Phoenix, uh, U.S. Airways Arena, I believe it was. It was the Western Conference semifinals, Rockets, Suns. I was in the press box on the road for that game. You can go back and Google this. Mary O'Elley hit a three-pointer from the corner to win the game for the Rockets. I'm in the press box with my fellow intern. I'm like, ah, sitting on my hand. No cheering in the press box, ever. You'll look like an amateur. Doesn't matter if you're young. Doesn't matter if you're 80. You don't cheer in the press box. There will be a point, Heike can speak to this, your teacher can speak to this, there will be a point when covering games becomes a beating. Trust me. You're covering a baseball team, Myron, in a 60-win season, and it's 112 degrees in August. Shoot me. <laughs> I've been there. Shoot me. A rain delay? Even worse. A few more things here. No autographs. Ever. I want you to take note of this. I mean, so many people have asked me over the course of my career, hey, can you give me an autograph of such and such? Dirk, Derek Holland, Tony Romo, Mike Madonna. No. No. And I want you to see this right here. Do you see this? This is my Texas Rangers credential. Okay, just so all of you know, if you're employees of a team, you'll get the exact same similar credential that has similar requirements. It says, no autographs. Your credentials can get revoked if you ask these guys for autographs. Now, I'm going I'm to be honest with you. There's some guys that are pretty cool. They have no problem with it. And between all of us girls here, we're all friends, right? Yeah? Yes? No? Yes? I'm just saying I'm going to take that as a yes. My boss at one of my old TV stations came up to me and asked me to get one of baseball's most cantankerous players an autograph for his daughter. This is my boss. This is not my direct supervisor. This is my grand poobah boss at my TV station. I'm going round and round here, right? I'm like, what do I do? I mean, this is my boss, the guy who controls my contract negotiations, my paychecks, everything, and he wants me to do something that would help him but would really jeopardize my credibility in the clubhouse. So it round and round. I even went to the Rangers PR guy, John Blake. And I said, John, my boss wants me to get this autograph. What should I do? And he's like, and, and because it was this particular guy, he said, Gina, you're on your own there. It had been like a Derek Holland or Michael Young kind of guy. It wouldn't have been a big deal. I could have gotten it completely on my own. But it, because it was this guy, we just decided no. And then finally I went to my boss and I said, look, I can't do it. No autographs. I can get my credential revoked. And everything was fine. But, but, but keep that in mind. People will ask you for autographs and gear and things of that nature. It can't be done. Not going to say. <laughs> you all know who it is. I mean, I'll just put it this way. You guys would definitely know who this is. Relationships in this industry are so important. This is a very small industry. Whatever aspect of the sports world it is that you work, it's a very small industry. And I want to let you in on a little secret in terms of references. You guys hear that, how important refer references are as you go further in your career? You can put a list of references on your resume. That's great, and you should do that. But if somebody sees your resume, and it says that, hey, you worked in Dallas at CBS 11, where I used to work. And you send this resume to the NBA PR office, for example. I happen to know the number two guy in the NBA PR office. He was my intern supervisor when I worked at the Houston Rockets. You 
may not put me on your references list, but you know who he's going to call? He's going to call me because he knows me. This is a business in which everyone knows everyone, and you really need to take that into consideration and be respectful, professionally polite, and courteous to every single person you encounter because everyone knows everyone, and everyone's a potential reference, a potential professional colleague, a, prof a potential mentor. Lots of valuable opportunities when you meet people. You're not getting along with everyone, and that's fine but you should still have that basic professional courtesy that really help you succeed in the long run in your career. As it comes to dealing with players, working with players is very important. Don't be a robot with them, yet have a professional courtesy with them. They understand you're human and that sometimes you're going to have to ask a tough question. The smart ones understand that. There are some that just may not get it. Um, but, but take time to get to know these guys and ladies that you end up covering or working with. Understand they're human. They all have bad days and good days. And once you humanize them a little bit more so than looking at them as athletes, they're humans, just like all of us, you will develop these relationships with these guys and these ladies that, that will go very far in helping your career, whether it be selling, whether it be marketing a team, or working in the media. What do we have here? Up, oh, paycheck. Everybody wants to know about the money, right? It's going to be peanuts. Peanuts. You'll make more money working at Starbucks. If you want to go into sports media, $17,000 a year, I think, is about the first um, first year salary for people who want to work in sports media. I've had anchors who were on government housing assistance because they made so little money and they were on TV five nights a week. And why is it so small? Because working in sports is something everybody wants to do because it's the best industry in the world, but employers leverage the competition against you. They always say, hey, you don't want to do this job? I got 3,000 other people lining up to do the job for free. And they probably would. They probably wouldn't do a good job, but they probably would. Peanuts, small money, so prepare for that. If you're a woman in this industry, I know there are only two ladies in this, in this room, you'll be judged a little bit more harshly, what, no matter what aspect of this industry you are in. I'm in sports media, so I'm really judging my appearance quite a bit. I, I show this picture because I was five months pregnant at the time, and it was a pregame show prior to the NBA Finals in Miami in 2011. I'm talking very serious basketball stuff, right? We're talking about Mavs, you know, this was, this wasn't the game they won, but, you know, the one right before they won in Miami, before they clinched in Miami. And, and I'm thinking I'm doing this great job, having big basketball discussion, and all I got was email that I look fat and that I've been eating too many Cuban black beans, and I'm like, this guy looks pregnant here. You know, I was thinking I look pretty good, but um, I hadn't come out of the closet about being pregnant, but so I was a little heavier than usual, but that's all people commented on. I mean, it's, it, a consultant once told me that the number one reason people change the channel or stop when they're scrolling through to watch TV is the appearance of the female anchor or the female host. So it is a tough business if you're a woman from an aesthetic standpoint, from a sports marketing and management standpoint. I've had this happen time and again. There is a little bit more of a prove yourself factor if you're a woman in this industry. Just keeping it real here, it really is. I uh, one time made a mistake on the air. I mean, I, I've gone out everywhere and people have, you know, Tell me who the backup quarterback is for the Dallas Cowboys. I'm like, really? Really? You want to go with me on this? Give me something a little more than that. But um, I one time made a mistake. I was doing the uh, 6 o'clock show, 6 o'clock sportscast, about 10 years ago. I was doing the 6 o'clock sportscast, and my male colleague was doing the 10. And both of us made a stupid, dumb mistake. We got a player's name mixed up. And the producer had actually written this in our script. And not to lay blame, it was my fault. And ultimately, the responsibility relies on the anchor get everything accurate, but I made that mistake. And keep in mind, the 6 o'clock show has a far fewer number of viewers than the 10 o'clock show. A 10 o'clock show in every market, um, or the 11 o'clock show on the East or West Coast, is your moneymaker newscast. I'm talking between 150 and half a million viewers. The 6 o'clock show is, you know, in Dallas, Fort Worth, it's about 75,000 viewers, 50,000 viewers. I got half a dozen email because I got something incorrect. My male colleague, with three times the viewers at 10, didn't get a single email. Just, you know, and the email range from Gina, you know better than that, to Gina, you done B-I-T-C-H. You know, what do you know? <laughs> just, just, you just gotta let it roll off the bat. I'm just saying, the, the microscope will be on you a little bit more if you're a woman in this industry. So guys, keep that in mind when you're talking to your female sports casting colleagues. Okay, this is the elephant in the room. The number one question I am always asked. What is it like going into a locker room, especially being a woman, because usually the only woman in the room? Um, they're going to be naked guys. Deal with it. You just, you have to be a pro about it. You have to be a pro. You just, you don't look around. You're in there. You go in there. You do your job. You talk to whom you're supposed to speak with and move on. And 
Specifically, my advice is never look down, always look up. Just think about that for a little bit. Be humble, be human, be yourself, and have fun. Best industry in the world working in sports. It is a roller coaster. The best highs, some brutal lows, but it's so much fun. And it's easy to get kind of a big head because you've got the coolest of cool factor jobs. When your buddy's, you know, crunching numbers during tax season at the accountant's office, you know, and you're at the ballpark getting ready for opening day or, you know, weekend home series against the Yankees, you're kicking booty, right? The pro from a professional standpoint. So it's easy to get kind of, kind of fool yourself from the cool factor standpoint. Don't do that because it really, you're no better than anybody else. You may have a cooler job, but just keep that in mind. I think I have one more slide on here. Um, additional things to consider, particularly as it relates to you guys. Internships, internships, internships. So important. You guys may not have that opportunity for internships for credit at this point. Consider shadow days. Reach out to people in the marketplace. This is the best sports market in the country, and I may be biased, but five professional teams, Cowboys, Mavericks, Stars, Rangers, FC Dallas, not one but two golf tournaments in the month of May, minor league teams, you're in the belly of this college beast, SMU, TCU, UTA, UNT. They all have sports marketing and sports media programs. You're three hours from any major Big 12 school. I mean, this is the belly of the sports beast. Right here in Dallas-Fort Worth, you've got the National Football Foundation, AT&T Stadium that hosts a symphony of sporting events. Um, you guys have a ton of opportunities here. Leverage your new media expertise. I want to go back to that. You guys will be expected to teach your boss with Snapchat, Twitter's so old school now that if you don't know Twitter, you might as well give up. Um, you really are going to be expected to be an expert in this space. Got a network to get work, guys. Trust me on this. Reach out to people. Keep in touch with people. Be polite. Be professional. And it will pay off. I promise you. Be adaptable. This industry will change. The technology with which you use to sell things and market things and, and communicate with people will change. Now, my bread and butter of my business is producing digital broadcast routines. I do um, Rough Riders Live for the Frisco Rough Riders. I'm going to be doing a show for FC Dallas as well. I mean, how many of us watch TV and consume media on these type of devices now, right? That's what we're doing. I'm producing shows on these type of devices. And where we will be three years from now, who knows? Uh, continue to learn. That's it. Well, we're good. We're holding you guys over. The next class is coming in until